Thank you all for joining me at this roundtable today. Um, we'll be discussing a very pressing subject, springboarding women and girls and ensuring access to digital opportunities. As the world ramps up uh, and all things digital speed up, internet usage is up, uh, some are getting left behind, women and girls especially, in developing and emerging markets. The UN has recently said that without decisive action from the international community and without collaboration, the digital divide could become the new face of inequality. That's a really scary prospect, um, and it's been a few years in the making. So today we'll be talking through uh, where we stand, the challenges we face, where, uh, what, what the solutions are and where we go from here. Um, what can we do to stop the divide from widening and for the, you know, and for digital inequality that risks basically setting us back on education for women and girls? How do we harness technology to do all of this? Here, I'd love to turn to Dr. Sheikh Abdullah Misnad, who is the former president of Qatar University and with uh, the Prime Minister's office in Qatar. Dr. Misnad, um, could you talk to us a little more about you know, where we are today and the challenges we're facing? Uh, hi, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, when I look into this subject, I look at it from a different context. Because I think uh, the digital gap for female or for women is more uh, within the socio-educational economic environment they live in, rather than just a gender per se. Because if you look at statistics now, we find that in developed countries, men and women nearly have the same access and utilization of digital technology, like over 80 or 90 percent, men and women. When we, when we look to the average of the developing world, we will find that 50, 52 for men, 40 something for uh, for women. So, and actually, the the gap is is uh, is decreasing. So, I I don't look at it as very drastic. I mean, as a lot of researcher and a lot of uh, literature on the internet shows, I think it's it's uh, the gap is uh, I mean is becoming less and less. And especially now, because now education also, education all over the world has also made a great achievement in, in terms of bringing the gap between men and women education. So I think it's the future is bright uh, from my point of view. And I think we should look at it from a uh, general or uh, more complex context than just like a gender issue. I'll stop at this and then maybe I can uh, add more during the discussion. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, you know, Dr. Dr. Lily Kong of Singapore University, Singapore Management University is also here with us today. And uh, Dr. Kong, you know, you, of course, have looked at education, you know, that is your, you know, where do we look at, where do we see the role of education in bridging this divide? Um, and how do we actually use it to leapfrog um, women and girls access to digital technology and even understanding how to use it? Uh, so thank you for that question, and I uh, would begin by saying that I agree very much with Dr. Shaker that, you know, in terms of access to and utilization of technology in the context of Singapore, and I dare say actually in um, some parts of Southeast Asia, um, the gender divide is actually not that stark. But where it is stark um, and the divide still remains is actually in terms of um, young girls and women going into STEM education and that whole pipeline that we talk about, you know, um, entering school, doing a STEM discipline, uh, going into university, enrolling in that as your major, um, and then, you know, sort of getting on into higher, still higher education, and whether it's a master's or a PhD, and eventually becoming a faculty member, it's a very leaky pipeline. And, you know, it's a leaky pipeline for women in higher education generally, but still more so in STEM. So just to cite you some examples in the, in the context of Singapore, if you look at the entire STEM cohort for um, university enrollment in Singapore, um, about 40%, I think, are women. And arguably, that's actually already fairly good compared to what it was um, just several years ago. Um, in recent times, there's been a lot more interest in, in uh, digital education, and so the, the numbers have gone up, the proportion has gone up. But if you think about STEM disciplines and you break that down into digital and information technologies vis-a-vis -vis health sciences, well, actually, it's very imbalanced. You get a whole lot more women in the health sciences enrolled in the health sciences as students than you do in digital 
um, and, and information technologies. And so when at that undergraduate base, you have that sort of imbalance, it gets still worse when it comes to higher degrees at you know, the master's and PhD level. And then the conversion of that into uh, faculty numbers, uh, the, the base for women gets shrinks still further. Right. And then again, at the faculty pyramid, when you think about the casual um, instructors, those who are on, on, on casual contracts, you think right. about those at the lower hierarchy um, of the professorial ladder, you get more women. And as you go further up, you get less and less. So what you get is um, a lack of role models. You get a lack of research and writing and including coding done by women, and that has knock-on effects. And so we absolutely need to address this through education by building the pipeline in education, or it will never sort of flow through into community and society. Absolutely, that sounds, you know, I, I think I'd love to bring in Kahina Van Dyke, Standard Chartered Bank here. Uh, Kahina was talking about um, the challenges that we face with, uh, with the pipeline and how the progress we have made so far isn't, we haven't made enough progress so far. And this is the moment to really, uh, really speed things up. Kahina, would you like to step in here? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been hearing about the pipeline issue for 25 years when I started, right? And people told me, oh, we have a pipeline issue, but by the time you get there, everything will be sorted out. And 25 years later, I'm here to say it's not been sorted out. So I think the, the what I would talk about is you need the digital, you need, of course, you need digital access, you need the educational opportunities, but then you definitely then need to be able to go out and start a career and be supported in that career in order for you to decide if you want to become a founder or you want to become a data scientist or you want to become a lead technologist. Um, and, or, at the end of the day, we need leaders in all of these fields. It's about leadership. And so what I would say is that the pipeline, um, you know, as um, you know, uh, the doctor was just talking about, we have in academics, they have a very leaky pipeline. I would argue that in financial services and in technology, the two industries I've spent 25 years in, we have an even leakier pipeline for women who start a career, make it to middle management, and then make it to the C-suite. And that's going to be really important to help pull through those young girls and those young women making decisions about what their major is and making decisions about what um, they choose for their professions to know that financial services and technology and data are actually incredible opportunities to unleash both their individual potential for prosperity and developing their communities. And I think that we have to own the fact that we haven't done a good enough job in technology or in financial services to ensure women see those leaders in the C-suite. Absolutely. You know, I think this the pipeline challenge, you know, we start about, we start you know, from a very young age and young girls with role models. And so I'd love to bring in Izzy Obeng here, who, um, who, is, who works with uh, kind of the, the startup world and, um, you know, providing, you know, the digital innovation ecosystem. Izzy, you were talking about role models and how that seems to be one of the single largest challenges that, you know, young girls and women face when they decide that this is a journey they want to embark on. Um, so is that, could you talk us a little, uh, talk us through, um, you know, the, the role model uh, challenge and it does sometimes come across as cliche, but you know, uh, it is real, right? Absolutely. And um, I don't want to take the leaky pipeline analogy even further, but it's so true when we look into the tech and startup ecosystem. Um, some great research was published in 2019 that showed that in terms of funding um, for female founders um, from venture capital firms, only uh, one penny in every British pound was going towards an all-female founding team um, and less than 10p was going to a mixed gender team and about 89 pence in a pound was going towards an all-male founding team. Wow. That's the kind of end result of a pipeline that has failed to support um, women into tech and entrepreneurship, provide them with the C-suite positions that we're talking about so they can build the operational capacity and the leadership capacity to grow. And it starts from uh, when girls are in school and they're being taught about different things and so at Foundervine a huge part of our work has been going into schools and providing practical opportunities to get young girls 
um, and young children from underserved communities outside of the classroom and working directly with corporates, working directly with tech firms, to give them the opportunity to be mini consultants, to work on projects themselves, because that's the way that we are going to level the playing field by showing young people who are very young who these role models are, bringing them into the classrooms, giving them the opportunity to go to these places and be um, and see what they can be rather. And I think that's that's really the key. And that point about um, uh, this need, needing to happen much more in developing countries. I'm based in Ghana and a lot of our work takes place in West Africa. The digital gap here for women is huge and we need to start much much earlier and we need to start for really basic things such as providing more electricity in classrooms dealing with a lot of the cultural biases that mean that young girls don't end up going to school in the same way and studying these subjects so a lot of work needs to be done and i think the key is starting young and bringing role models into the classroom as well Absolutely. I think, you know, some of the things that come up frequently, um, you know, is that there's network coverage, especially in developing emerging markets, there's a lot of network coverage, but when it comes to actual access uh, and then understanding how to use it, there's a huge divide. Um, I think one of the things you raised, um, Izzy, was, uh, you know, we start young and we start by ensuring that there is some, that we, you know, there, there's this big divide and we need to start young, but how do we do that? How do we get over these barriers? And I'd love to hear from, from you on this and, um, you know, from, from those who are at, you know, who, who've actually, you know, strong female leaders and, and Thajos who've all kind of made it up uh, through this pipeline in a way, um, you know, somehow you didn't get leaked out. So um, would love to hear from you about that. You know, where is that, what, what, what is the problem there? You know, what is the big, practical hurdle we're facing. Fiona, please. Uh, Shall I jump in? Yeah, Fiona, please do, please Hi. do. Thank, thanks for having me. I'm Fiona from the Women's Foundation um, in Hong Kong and, and, and similar to um, Dr. Kong in Singapore, we're very concerned about the you know, the lack of, of, of women in, in STEM and, that, and those barriers for STEM education. And we do run a Girls Go Tech and other STEM programs really to address some of the uh, some of the challenges. And part of the heart of it really goes to gender gender stereotypes. Um, so what some of our research has, has shown is that boys are four times more likely in Hong Kong to enter STEM-related degrees and careers, which is really worrying for, for implications for young women's futures. Girls are more likely to drop out of STEM courses. Girls don't think STEM subjects are important for their future. And then entrenched gender biases where there's almost this, this sort of perception that boys have an inborn talent, particularly around math. And that, that sort of leads to and that girls can only attain good results from studying really hard, et cetera. So that stereotypical um, you know, concept really undermines girls' self-confidence in, in STEM. We've also found that girls want, want to enter into jobs that help people, that are meaningful. Um, and so all of these things are sort of providing a bit of a disconnect. So really at the start of it is really to start early. We do start in primary school, then into secondary school, and to really try, try and disrupt those stereotypes, work with teachers, work with parents, um, bring in place role models, as another speaker has said. And part of our research has shown that girls want to see role models they can relate to. It's not necessarily always the CEO, but that someone, you know, mid-career or first starting out, that's that's really something that they can um, aspire to. Learning coding early, so it's really, uh, you know, practices for the long for the long haul ecosystem collaboration. Because I think what we're really trying to do is increase the number of girls that will take STEM subjects at school, at university, and then enter into the workforce. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, June, I want to bring you in here because, you know, you set up Mums in Tech when you were on maternity leave. And, you know, that's often one part of the pipeline where we see a lot of leakage. I think it's, um, or at least after that. And, you know, women are often, not a it's not seen as a hurdle, but it's seen often, you know, sometimes it is a bit of a setback. Um, I'm sure, you know, those with children and those who have managed women who have potentially kind of felt a little discouraged at, at that point. So June would love to hear from you um, about working mothers, about, you know, why you set up Moms in Tech and why on maternity leave? 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, the first thing that caused me to, to start up Mums in Tech was just the lack of um, facilities that existed for me to go into and learn to code with my baby. It didn't exist. And childcare is something we talk about. How many companies offer childcare on site? We need to think about how we get more mothers back in, how to um, provide affordable childcare. Um, and also coding schools were really expensive. So I really set it up so that we could provide affordable coding, but also practical experience, similar to what Izzy was talking about, going into these tech organizations like Marks and Spencer, Ministry of Justice, and having courses that were taught by the staff. So not only are you ga gaining really practical experience, you're getting to meet the people doing the jobs. It feels really relevant. You understand why you're learning to code, but also the opportunities that exist for you. You know, tech is a very lucrative career. And I think not many people realize just how well paid it is. And I think that's important to understand that that's um, something we need to shout out a bit more about. We need to talk about the role models that exist in these organizations. Um, I also sit on the board of um, an app called Kajiko. And I think something to remember in sort of more um, sort of less developed countries is almost every girl may have access to a mobile phone. And apps like Kajiko um, give them access to role models at their fingertips. You know, it's it's very wow. modern, it's gamified. 98% um, of girls who are using the apps aspire to be um, on the board, which I think it's really important wow. that we start getting them thinking big because that's Absolutely. the reality. These are our future yeah. CEOs and they need to start now. Absolutely, I think on that point that, you know, you, you definitely, I, I think the point on role models is sometimes um, underestimated. You know, we talk a lot about mentorship and mentees and finding mentors, but a lot, some of that's organic, but some of it is, you know, you have to live and breathe it. It's a lot of it's osmosis ultimately, right? Um, not everyone is sitting here looking for um, a role model to chase and has, you know, has this career plan worked out. Um, so, so you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, Deirdre, I'd love to bring you in here um, on, you know, you're you're at a large firm and uh, one of the challenges um, that you had mentioned earlier when we were talking was about uh, leadership and how, you know, and, and energy, two separate things. Um, could you start, could you talk to us uh, through your lens uh, what the challenges are? Well, for Angie, great to be part of the conversation, first of all. And I think especially today is International Women in Engineering Day, so a very special day to be talking about the topic. Um, look, I think as a company, we've got a lot of responsibilities. And I think, you know, I'm very proud of being part of Schneider Electric um, as, a, as an engineering and, and technology company in the energy management and automation space. We really have a big responsibility to play, you know, for, from our leadership perspective, as you talk about. And I think uh, that role models has been talked about a lot. And, and I think we've really led that as an organisation. So certainly for 15 years, 16 years I've been with this company, it's certainly a business agenda. It's not a HR topic coming from HR. It's good, good that we talk about business as a performance. Diversity is is brings performance, better performance. So I, I'm very proud that as a company, we've really managed to, 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 to drive a strong leadership in our organisation. And we've really changed the needle. I, I know some people said the part, you know, it's still not really where we need to be, but we have moved the needle in terms of representation. So at our leadership level, we have 47% of our executive committee uh, are females. And and, I, and my leader for the industrial automation is actually uh, on this, this panel, uh, this forum, sorry, later today, talking about supply chain sustainability sustainability, Barbara Frey. So she leads industrial automation. So having a female leader, I think it really does create that um, that agenda and that sponsorship as an organisation that it's led from the top and then all leaders, uh, you know, really do follow that through as an organisation. So I think that's, that's a really important part. And the, the second thing I think as a company is that we really do need, we have we have a social responsibility and, and, and someone mentioned about, you know, meaningful, I think it was, uh, I think it was Fiona talked about people want to have meaningful opportunities. So, so how do we create that sustainability story and, and how do we bring that in, in a very meaningful way? So it's about us putting back into the community and, and I think through our role models, you know, part of the, the STEM programs, part of the WISE Women um, have women uh, Network groups, we really do have a lot of sponsors.
sponsors who go out to the community and we do a lot of work with with companies, industries. But I think also, as as talked about in terms of education institutions um, and very early, I mean, I come from Sydney, Australia, and I'm very proud that in the Sydney, Australia, we have a program that we we, we, we call, we, we, we launch and uh, women to, to try to get, get our, our people who are in WISE to actually go out to the community to 10-year-olds to say, actually, engineering digital is an is a, a opportunity you can have. And it's a very interesting career. So I think it's, you know, it's really important that we, as a community, we do that. And then also I'd say in terms of the, um, you know, helping the underprivileged communities and communities that maybe need a little bit more of a leg up, I would say, in terms of those areas. And certainly, again, um, you know, going out to, to the community um, to help people to have more access to energy. You mentioned that at the beginning, Angie. You know, yeah. th- people don't have equal access to energy around the world. And so we've really targeted them through our Schneider Electric Foundation and more recently with our Tomorrow Rising Fund, um, which is really focused on the, the COVID pandemic and how we can help the community. We've really helped people to be connected, to have electricity, to have digital tools that, that they may Absolutely. not have had. So I think I think there's a lot of responsibility for us as a company and then how we yeah. drive in our company, yeah. but also what we do in terms of our community um, and getting out to, you know, certainly both the institutions and, and, and network groups. For sure. You know, I think we are, we're hearing so much from, um, from companies, from universities, and uh, th- there is this you know, there is an effort, there's a big effort here. Um, Tejas, I want to turn to you because you were talking, you you know, again, you're at an organization which is very much focused on technology. Uh, You're led from the top by a woman. Um, You know, within your organization, there is a big focus on bringing women into leadership and, you know, um, using technology. Your, Your focus area is that as well. Talk to us a little about kind of, you know, as a company and as, you know, in your day-to-day work with clients, what what do you see, you know, where we stand and what the challenges are, but also, you know, how do we bring all of this together? Everyone's working on pushing this agenda, right, in their different ways, whether it's through providing, like, Georgie was just talking about energy and whether it was Fiona's, fa- uh, with the, uh, Fiona's work with the, uh, the Women's Foundation. I mean, how do we bring this together and what are you seeing in, um, in kind of the work that you do and within your organization. Yeah, sure. Thanks. And by the way, I, I just realized that I'm the only male on this panel, so I don't know if that was my design, but I feel privileged uh, to be with this great group here. Well, this uh, is why I said, I said the lovely, all are like powerful, lovely ladies here at Tejas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so listen, you know, I think we've, we've talked about the, the importance of making sure we start young. Uh, And, you know, we have opportunities uh, with with our education programs, our STEM programs, et cetera. But, you know, the real challenge is going to be when they get into organizations, when our when women population get into the organization, how do you retain them? Uh, And, you know, we as Accenture as a services organization, uh, you know, we're in the people business. We employ half a million people globally. And and this is fundamental to us that how do we make sure we are retaining the retaining our our, uh, female uh, population and also promoting them into the ranks of leadership? Um, which is not an easy task, right? This has to be, policies have to be considered. You know, we have worked aggressively on our, not only on maternity leaves, but also paternal leaves, right? This is about how we can have also men uh, take uh, vacations and holidays and take care of the family while their significant others are working. Uh, so, you know, we've have, we have encouraged policies around that. Uh, we have mandated, uh, at least prior to, prior to the pan- pandemic, two days working from home because a lot of people flying around the globe and, you know, we said, hey, we got to go make sure that people are working from home. Now, this does have an impact to our clients because clients expect, as is Accenture saying, you got to be in person. But this was a policy that we said we got to go enforce and we got to drive that step change. Now, our client might not uh, you know, accept that. Uh, we got to try and work around it. But for the most part, our clients have been receiving with that uh, you know, policy. They say, you know, this makes sense. Uh, we got to have that work-life balance, have people be more uh, at their at their home locations and work with their families uh, remotely. So, you know, I think those policies are important. Uh, we are um, making progresses on, you know, how do you go enable uh, technology education or what we're calling TQ, technology portion within the organization. And this is a top ground driven agenda uh, from starting from our CEO, where cloud computing, artificial intelligence, uh, of AR, VR, 5G and edge compute, which are important technologies today, they're emerging and they're accelerating at pace. Uh, you know, how do we get everyone uh, skilled up? This is not just about male and females, but everyone skilled up because it's important. And more importantly, like I think there's a there's a quote there that, you know, 
tech is lucrative and we yes. all can make uh, very successful careers out of that. And I think a lot of people are starting to realize that, but it is that inclusion on not just as one company, but everyone has to come together. In our case, our clients uh, also have to support the policies we are driving towards making this an inclusive culture. Absolutely. Deirdre, did you so, want to jump in there? So TTC, I think you, you touched on a lot of great things around what we what organisations can do to create the environment to attract and retain women in digital roles. And I know uh, earlier on um, it was mentioned around, you know, uh, having uh, policies around childcare. But I think, you know, certainly with the, with the pandemic in mind, the hybrid working has been both a, a benefit and, and, and a stressful situation uh, for women in the workforce. And I, I hope the needle moves a little bit around, you know, family responsibilities that, that is coming out of that. So I think you've really touched on a lot of those really important areas. And I think the other area that I'd really probably like to amplify is that advocacy. And really what we've tried to do and is, is to bring that image outside. And we've been very, very out vocal in the marketplace around what we do and how we drive the, the gender diversity topic and being active in STEM and whatever that might be. So I think the advocacy is really, and that, that advocacy could be the leaders or it could be a, a female leader, a female engineer, female uh, software uh, profile. So it can be anyone. And, and as you said, it could be male or female driving those things. So I think that's something that we really want to, to make sure that we, we create that environment that we do in the marketplace. And again, we've been very proud for the last three years. We've been part of the Bloomberg uh, Gender Equity Index because we, of the actions that we've taken. And again, I think bringing the outside in has had a great impact on internally on people, how people, people, people feel about diversity in our organisation. They're much more aware a lot from what we've done in the outside world. Great. Thank you so much, Deirdre. Uh, Dr. Dr. Almasnav, please, please um, uh, we'd love to hear from you on this. You know, you look at this from, uh, fr from you know, a very big uh, overarching policy level. And uh, so we'd love to hear from you of, you know, what you're seeing in Qatar, what's worked, what's not, um, and how we, you know, how we use some of the initiatives that are happening in many of these companies uh, to kind of talk more about advocacy. Uh, I think I will be happy to talk about uh, Qatar because Qatar is a very successful story. Qatar is a very wealthy nation committed to education and economic progress. So I can say that, uh, the, the, that we don't have digital gap as it is in, in so many other developing countries. Uh, for, for instance, uh, Qatar for the last 20 years make a, made a large investment in education. And now we have I mean, universal primary education, colleges, uh, university at all level. And women represent nearly over 60% of student population at those colleges and universities. And you know a lot of uh, uh, the guests here are talking about uh, STEM and science. And I have been hearing about that for the last 40 years as well. Actually, in Qatar and maybe in the rest of the Gulf, this this issue does not exist. We don't have problem with women joining sciences or engineering or technology. Uh, for example, at Qatar University, 68% of students and computer science and computer engineering are women. I mean, wow. Uh, wow. it is the opposite. I remember when I was the president of Qatar University, we have to campaign among the men to join these uh, disciplines. And sometimes <laughs> we lower we lower the, the admission. <laughs> it's not fair for order to have more men in this discipline. But we don't have an issue. I know it is in the West and has been there for a long time. I mean, somebody explained it as because of uh, women when they are co-educated with men, they, want, they don't want to show that they are intelligent or whatever. But anyway, we are lucky enough to don't have it. Uh, so these women who are graduated from, uh, from technology or uh, engineering, they will be a good asset for the country in, term, in terms of coding, in terms of program, developing things which is more uh, suitable. However, uh, having, uh, having women or young generation uh, uh, in Qatar with such uh, savvy knowledge of using technology, I mean, of course, women in Qatar has not to face the hindrance which is the availability, the affordability, the skills, which is a lot of other women may be involved in the space. However, it, having this uh, knowledge about technology has helped women in the country quite a lot. We have a lot of business women now who use uh, Instagram, other social media to do their business. But more importantly, now in the for, uh, next September, we'll have the parliamentary election. And that was a 
this is a great opportunity for Qatar women who would like to nominate themselves. Because, you know, still in Qatar, women will not, cannot go on the street and go to people's houses and knock the door and all of that. Yeah. We don't have the majlis like men where they sit together and they discuss. So technology is really handy for women to communicate with their uh, with their author, to uh, explain their agenda, to get in every house and every place without really being critically there. So that's a great advantage for women uh, at the moment. Uh, but there's just a small point. I think we always talk about women and we never, and what we should think also that women are mothers. They are not only as, a, as, as men. So there is another responsibility on women, which I think we should take care about, especially in the about women. I will stop at that and I will continue. No, thank you so much. You know, I think you, you, Qatar itself is a role model, I think, for many countries, uh, in not only just in the region, but across the developing and emerging world and across, I mean, even the developed world for that matter. Um, you know, it's, it's I, I think I want to bring in Kahina here. Kahina, you wanted to jump in. Um, yeah, I just... Um, Qatar is a, is a role model. It's great to hear those numbers. And it's just two points that I wanted to add to the conversation. Number one is that there are very different realities across the world. We operate in 60 markets at Standard Chartered. And because of that, we see the, the digital divide, the economic inclusion divide, the opportunity divide. And so I think it is important um, to recognize that different markets have completely different realities when it comes to um, access and opportunities. But what I wanted to, to really um, focus on is around the measurement of progress, because we talked earlier and said we're making progress, but are we making it fast enough? And so I think it's important as academics, as, uh, as corporates, to say that we actually are going to hold ourselves accountable um, to having greater representation at all levels along the pipeline um, and, and really holding ourselves to numbers, because you can't really manage what you don't measure. And, you know, I would just say I'm proud of the fact that in our digital, um, you know, team, digital and data team, my chief data officer is a woman, um, but we have 50% of the global management team um, in digital and data as women and 50% are men. And that lets us know that we're actually representative of the world population because that's the population. And I think it's really important that we, that we um, have that type of of accountability because what I've heard from young women coming in early careers out of university or you know early to mid careers is they are coming to teams that they think they have an opportunity to reach their full potential. And so I just, you know, we talked about role modeling in the, the abstract, but what I'm saying is that I really think we need to talk about it with specificity and we need our corporations um, and our institutions to make commitments around having that representation show up um, at all levels of leadership. And, and that is going to be really important as we move forward, because then we know if we're making progress. And just like Qatar can proudly say 60% of our graduates, we should all be able to say 50% of our leadership and 50% of our inbound intern classes um, are, are women and, uh, and, and young, um, young or older um, women returning potentially even after, you know, they've had That's children, right. but they've had a degree. So I just think it's important that we actually measure some of this progress. No, that's a great point. Um, and we'll come back to that because I want to bring Tejas in on that. Um, I wanted to ju just jump to uh, Dr. Kong, uh, Professor Kong from um, from Singapore Management University and you know your perspective on, you know, the, of course, the Singapore model and of course, from an education perspective, what you see as, you know, what you could um, kind of what what you see from the measurement perspective and also from, you know, to some of the points uh, Dr. Al-Misnath had raised. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, I actually wanted to pick up from uh, some of the comments that, you know, um, recognizing the leaky pipeline is one thing, but what do we do about it? And I wanted to talk about it in okay. terms of both macro policy as well as micro um, practices, if you will. Right. And at the macro level, um, certainly in the context of Singapore, um, there's a lot of conversation around government policy and what it can do to shift the needle. But it's also about corporate policy. 
And when we talk about um, uh, the introduction of policy, uh, even legislation, um, it's not necessarily specific only to um, sort of upping the participation rate of women in um, technology, for example. It's actually more generally addressing the lot of women and the gender gaps that exist. So whether it's a gender age uh, wage gap or whether it's uh, maternity leave and paternity leave or it's board representation, at the macro level, the, the, it's absolutely necessary for governments and corporates to take leadership and to take positions in the same way that um, I think Kahina was talking about earlier, holding ourselves up to certain standards, putting in place policies and actually effecting those policies. But I also want to just spend a little moment talking about micro practices that, you know, even while we have broad directions, policies and so forth, at the end of the day, it comes down to the everyday micro practices. For example, the implicit biases that we might have while we're interviewing, um, you know, the, the um, okay. sort of blind spots that we have when, um, you know, we, we look at certain um, applications for jobs or we're looking at applications for a position, uh, for a place in a university. Um, the interview panels um, are very often um, perhaps not sensitized to these issues and um, have embedded and implicit assumptions. And that gets played through in the micro practice of selection. Um, so I, I just wanted to add um, this perspective of a balance between the need for macro policy, but also a sensitivity to micro practice. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, you know, that's such a great point because I think in all our organizations, uh, you know, especially over the last few years, there's been a huge push on diversity and inclusion and, uh, and equality and a big conversation around microaggressions and micro practices and so many things that, you know, you, people, you know, we have such diverse and huge organizations and uh, the people come from such such different social and cultural norms that something maybe rude in one place is not another is expected and some is not expected elsewhere. And so Deirdre, you had uh, wanted to step in here. So I want to bring you in for a couple minutes and then I'll turn to June, but please, please jump in. Yeah, I mean, I think Lily's point around the, uh, you know, the hidden biases is, is, is we've been training in the hidden bias for quite a few years. We all have biases. We People try to say that they don't, but we all do. Um, so, so I think that's a good point. But I think building on the macro, micro and what Kahina was saying and, and Shakia, I think, you know, what's really important, we're a global company, we're French uh, on the French stock exchange, but we have a, 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 a hub strategy that we don't say everything's centered around France. So it's whether we, I'm here in the Hong Kong office and then also we've got a, a Boston hub. So so, and, and a Dubai hub. So I think it was important to have that footprint so that we really do manage our policies and our processes, not from a one size fits all, but from a really, from a policy of, of what's fit for purpose. So we, we, we say that we want to be the most truly, the most global local company. And I think it is very different. Um, you, know, you know, certainly the numbers of women in, in STEM in, in different countries, Middle East is certainly a strong uh, foundation um, in, in, in Russia as well. You know, there's certainly some countries where we don't necessarily see those differences. But then obviously yeah. there's the country mm -hmm. to do. So I think it's really important to make sure that we, we have global practices and, and, and has our, our global landscape, it's really important to make sure that we do focus also on what's most fit for purpose in that local uh, market. Absolutely. Uh, June, I want to turn to you really quickly. Uh, you wanted uh, to step in on um, some of the stuff that I think Dr. Kong and Kahina were saying. Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, we, we all know why it's important to educate girls. We know that it's an urgent situation because we're playing catch up. COVID has played a massive role in setting a lot of girls back, you know, and, and with schools being closed, especially in, in less developed regions. But I really wanted to, to say that we, we can all play a role. Like we all have a lot of power, just us sitting at the table today. And, and a lot of it is actually financial inclusion when you really think about it. How can we make it possible for these young girls in remote regions to have access to mobile phones? We talked about that earlier. How do we make it possible for them to access great content so that they are inspired to start wanting to get into technology careers? How do we make sure that there are jobs waiting for them when they graduate to step into? How do we make sure that we encourage them to stay? Because I think, you know, we talk about inclusion and diversity and you know how do you make people feel that they're welcome and and they can thrive within organizations you know Ted just talked about um, 
inclusive policies within within Accenture and and Deirdre and I and I think it's 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 great to hear that this is happening but how do you keep shouting about this and encouraging your counterparts and other organizations to feel empowered to do the same I think this this is really critical so that you know the buck doesn't stop here how do we make everyone feel that they have a responsibility as well to move things forward Absolutely. And I think it goes beyond just corporate social responsibility. I think this goes, you know, becomes this needs to be kind of the core of what we do, not a side, uh, something that something can be put in a corporate social resp- annual corporate social responsibility report. Um, I think we need to set really realistic goals from what every everyone's saying. And, you know, a lot of the organizations are doing that. Um, I think I want to bring in Izzy here because Izzy, you're, you guys are putting, you know, you're taking kids into uh, a lot of these places and helping them you know get on get on the ground kind of vocational training effectively um you know tell us tell us more absolutely and um it is absolutely so powerful and um i think back to a program we run in which we brought children from townships from south africa to east london to work with working class kids in east london to advise pwc on how they can be more sustainable and some of the ideas that came from that you know i think um, some of the consultants were taking notes and that's the kind of activity that we can do a lot more of um, and the final point i wanted to make is that you don't have to be a massive corporate in order to do it i know many Many of us on this call come from larger organizations where there may be the resource um, you know and the kind of um, understanding and knowledge internally to do this work but we work at Found Divine with much smaller organizations who often get to a point where they're too big and they look back and they haven't implemented the policies they haven't looked into what their diverse and inclusion culture is and they simply haven't created the foundations that they need to create an inclusive organization that genuinely welcomes all so what can we be doing as small businesses as micro entrepreneurs to really really shift the dial as well and I think that first step is recognizing that we all have an individual responsibility towards making a difference we can find the knowledge understand what it means not just to be um not just to be uh you know uh, unbiased or colorblind as people tend to say or whatever it is genuinely interested in educating ourselves on gender equality anti-racism whatever that is and we can all do that regardless of the size of our organizations You know, I think you were gonna you were gonna step in here. Yeah, um, I'm loving this conversation. I think it's fantastic. I think uh, agree that we all need to come together. You know, uh, companies, uh, governments, academics, NGOs, um, and we we certainly ask companies to set to set targets because what gets measured does get done. I just want to bring in an, an, another point that particularly the, what we're seeing through. COVID-19 COVID um, around dig- really around the inclusion piece around digital access. We know we're making some strides in digital access. We're not there yet. I think we've seen certainly in different markets actual challenges with ac- access. But the real piece is around inclusion and how meaningfully people can engage and women and girls can engage with technology. So I think that is such a critical point in terms of just that overlay of when we're developing products, services, that that gender lens is put through all of those. And part of the real challenge through COVID-19 is also just safety for women and girls online, along with huge increases in domestic violence, sexual violence, um, online abuse has gone through the roof uh, during COVID-19, and particularly for women and girls, and that is a huge problem. So when we talk about inclusion and safety, that as a sort of public policy issue, I think we need to also, we can't address, you know, the pipeline in corporates without also looking at, at these issues. They're also so interconnected. You know, I think you were, I, you know, we, we're coming to the end, but I want to bring in, I know we have a lot of um, great speakers here who have uh, something to add to this. Kahina, I want to quickly bring you in and then I'll uh, turn to Dr. al was that me? Was that Kahina? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Kahina. Kahina, sorry. So, Kahina. Yeah, I, so I would just end with, I think, what we all know, which is we are better when girls and women are included in 
the digital first and data driven world that we all find ourselves in. We are better as societies, we are better as companies, whether a big company or a small company, we are just simply better. And that realization that this isn't just something to do because it's the right thing to do, although it is, it's the thing to do because we need their intellectual capital, their energy, their creativity, and their innovation. And I think that's something that I would love if the conversation started from, we need them and we need to show up for them as well. Thank you so much, Kahina. Dr. al Misnad. you know, we've got, this conversation could go on forever, I feel like, but I wanna bring you in really quickly towards the end here. It's very obvious that strategy and policy to bridge the gap is, it had to be custom made to each region and each country, because from the discussion, it's obvious. There is so many differences. But I think there is one important point that I think how to make women aware of how technology can improve their life. I think a lot of women are not aware of that. They don't see the relevance of technology to their life. And this is going to be also one of the solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Al Misnad. Um, I know we had speakers who wanted to step in. We're running out of time, unfortunately. Um, you know, let me see if I can get a couple more minutes in here. Um, Tejas, I want to return to you really quickly. I know you were trying to say something here, but I want to give you, give me, give me your last final line. Give me, I'm going to give you 10 seconds. I, I couldn't agree more with Kahina, right? I mean, this is all, this is not just about a check in the box that we got to get more diverse. I mean, diversity is a fact. Inclusion is what's going to be important for us because innovation is going to be driven through inclusion and the diversity in thoughts. So this is why it's critical uh, because the world is hungry for more innovation. Uh, if 2020 was a treadmill run that we had out 2021 and sorry, 2020 and 2021 and beyond is going to be a marathon and a sprint uh, with all the evolution that's taking place and women have to be front and center in that. So I, I leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the speakers and panelists who joined. Um, we are, you know, we're going to wrap this up. Oh, it looks like they've given us a few more minutes, a few more seconds. Um, Deirdre, I want to bring, uh, bring you in really quickly. I'm going to give you 10 seconds and then Dr. Uh, Dr. Kong, another 10 seconds. Yeah, a lot of people are really quoting Peter Drucker, what gets measured gets done. And I think more than setting targets, about setting ambitious targets to really stretch ourselves if we are going to move the needle um, and, and, and really just address the topic. So I think it's important that we set ambitious targets. Absolutely. Uh, Professor Kong. Yes, um, thank you for the last word. I think absolutely I agree with the fact that we need to set targets uh, without actually um, uh, sort of getting into a sort of um, affirmative action, right? I think women have to be there because of the uh, abilities and, and what they can contribute. And indeed, as Kahinia said, there's a lot. If we can just recognize what can be contributed, we would naturally give them the space. <laughs> Absolutely. I think we've had such a fantastic discussion here. Um, you know, I, I think this could, we didn't even get in. I, th I feel like we could have got a lot of, a lot deeper on this. Uh, you know, would have loved to talk more about measurement and, you know, specific but ambitious targets um, and strategies and policies and look to models of success like Qatar. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and we'll wrap it up here. Thank you.